Hi, welcome. Tonight we're talking about the weather model and we'll also be discussing the geo field. So it'll be a pretty interesting presentation. Of course, we're talking about things from the universal model and new millennial science, which is a, this book here that was uh, recently published. Uh, volume one is all about the Earth system. And so we're going to be going through chapter nine, which is the last science chapter in this volume. And, um, and it's all about the weather model and the geofield. And my name is Alan Wade. So what causes the weather to change? Right? It changes quite a bit. We kind of had a surprise rainstorm recently. And um, I had an interesting discussion with my class here at American Family Education. And they were able to come up with a lot of reasons. Uh, five reasons were all stated by a meteorologist. And there were, um, but they also came up with some other reasons which um, actually are presented in the universal model. So I was really proud of my students on that. So uh, the first thing here in the weather model is that climatologists say that forecasting is still an inexact science. Even though satellites can see the weather coming, um, you know, from way out in the ocean in this case, uh, you can see it coming over towards Florida. Um, so we have a lot more technology, but we still have trouble predicting the weather. And there was one meteorologist that gave a presentation with this title, Predictability, Does the Flap of a Butterfly's Wing in Brazil Set Off a Tornado in Texas? And so it's an interesting idea, and of course he was trying to present that that small things can cause a much larger effect. Um, but it also kind of indicates that um, there is a lot of questions and they, they don't really know what is changing the weather. Um, in fact, as we looked at the five things that that meteorologist uh, mentioned, uh, not this one, but another one, um, none of those really change. And so how could they cause the changes in the weather? So we actually need a new idea. Now we talked before about magma, and if magma existed, it should have a big effect on the weather. But because magma does not exist, such a connection has never been made. If we had a big ball of fire down in the um, depths of the earth, in the core and center of the earth, then that heat would be radiating out. Um, but that hasn't been um, shown. So it's not complicated, although that looks complicated on the left. If you can, you can read it on the right, and it's very simple. The earth has a great global weather engine because it is a hydroplanet. And we talked about the hydroplanet model uh, two months ago. And that, as you will see, ties right in to um, this weather model. And one of the biggest things is earthquake weather. Because earthquakes cause frictional heating down in the, in the uh, fault lines inside the earth. And that causes water vapor to escape. So the reason modern science does not recognize the connection between weather and earthquakes is because of the USGS statement like the following. Nowadays, thanks to the advent of science, it has been shown there is no connection between weather and earthquakes. But as you'll see as we go through that, we believe there's a dramatic connection, a direct connection between earthquakes and weather. And as you can see in this picture, uh, the water vapor that's escaping from inside the earth is going to uh, filter up through the fault line and, and up through the ground and then spread out because that's what steam does. Um, 
the, the volume of steam, when water changes to steam, the volume changes 1,700 a, a times the volume. So a little bit of water is going to make a whole lot of steam, and so it expands dramatically. And it expands in all directions. So earthquakes do more than just move the surface of the crust. Earthquake heat is the second source of heat for weather. And um, Russian scientists have shown this. Some of the first investigators to clearly establish a direct link between earthquakes, crustal heating, and the changes in the weather over the earthquake area was done by these Russian scientists. And this is showing you a um, picture of that little peninsula that's up above Japan and uh, in the uh, east end of Russia and uh, off the coast of China. So the earthquake there caused a large heated area and they were able to detect that. Um, this is showing a connection between earthquake heating and the weather. We have the um, Chimachka earthquake in 1993, and you can see at the, on the bottom when that earthquake hit, a, a big spike in the red line there, and then that was also measured in the hot spring water flow rate, which is in the blue. And there is a rise in temperature in that area that happened before the earthquake hit because it is causing that um, air to heat up, right? As the, as the earthquake is getting ready to start, as the pressure is being applied, you have that frictional heating starting, and so it's heating that air uh, temperature. So we can explain this whereas modern science would have no real explanation for that. So we call it a hyquatherm, an earthquake-heated water system inside the crust that generates pressure systems in the atmosphere that change the weather. And so that hyquatherm uh, comes from hydro and quake, from earthquake, and then thermal is the heat that's generated. And so it's causing not only can it melt rocks, but the water inside the earth, um, the water or hydro there is turning to steam, and that steam then escapes up through the ground, um, either along the fault line or through the dirt, and then out into the atmosphere. So we need to create a new water cycle. Yes, you had a question. Not every earthquake uh, ends up as a volcano because I, the water inside kind of cools it off, kind of like a radiator. Yeah, I, I, your question I think is very good. You're asking if the not every earthquake produces lava because it's cooled down with the water um, like a radiator, and I think you're exactly right that uh, there are areas, in fact, when we looked at the uh, crust of the earth, there were some areas where we could see where the fault line was and we could see the heating, but we also saw the water kind of cooling it off in that area too. So there was kind of hot and cold close together there, and it does depend on the amount of water. Uh, like I remember one of the places with down, down in Mexico um, where there's a fault line, but there's also two oceans on either side um, that can cool it off. So you're, you're exactly right. Um, now, the, the water cycle is what we are taught in elementary school as a way to explain um, weather. And it basically looks like this. Um, you can see this was taken from a USGS um, down in the bottom left of the picture there, uh, USGS diagram. And the only source of heat in this diagram is the sun. But if you think about it, the sun... It goes around the Earth, but it's pretty much the same every day. Um, and so why would it have such dramatic changes, sometimes very quick changes, 
in the weather, where clouds will billow up in hours. And, um, and then all of a sudden you can get rain. Um, so the, the picture that they show is that the water is evaporating. As the sun goes over the oceans, it evaporates the water. And then that, those clouds drift all the way in from the ocean. But we have clouds form in Arizona, too. Uh, some may come from California and the ocean, but certainly not all of them. And, um, and so there are clouds that billow up. And, uh, you know, you could have some from lakes or rivers that are inland, but, you know, here in the Arizona desert, there are some places where you, you don't have that much um, land water. Um, so where, where are the clouds coming from, and, and does this water cycle really hold? Um, and there's really no engine in this for new weather patterns because vaporization is a very slow process. So we need a new weather model. This is the old water cycle, and the universal model has a new weather cycle that includes the sun heating and evaporation, but it also has the hyquothermal process created new storms and weather patterns. This vaporization can be slow or rapid, and we have two heat sources because down here in the earth, we have the hyquotherms. Um, so along the fault lines there, you have frictional heating. And these hyquotherms are um, not only heating the rocks, but they're heating the groundwater. And that groundwater is what we call endovaporization. So it's turning water inside the earth to vapor or steam uh, from inside the earth. Endo is inside the earth and vaporization is changing water to steam. So endovaporization is the word. Um, and this gives a simple explanation then for why we have hot springs um, as shown here. We also have hyquotherms under the ocean that is causing ocean heating. Okay which we'll talk about more as we go along. So a lot of the same processes, but by having two sources of heat, now we have lots of variety, lots of opportunity to change the weather and to have new storms popping up. Any questions about that? Okay. Yeah, it does make sense. But, I mean, in the middle of Montana, you wouldn't have clouds. They'd have to literally roll all the way across the United States. Yeah. The center of the, you know. yeah you said, Great Plains or some rivers and lakes and some, but yeah. Um, would it be enough to cause the storms? Oh, yeah, and when a whole lake is frozen. There's no vaporization, or if it was vaporizing, then it wouldn't be ice. Right. If there is any storm in winter, where is it coming you from? You have to follow it all the way across from the ocean or a melted source of water all the way right. to snow. Yep. And, and yet you can look at uh, satellite pictures and you can see the clouds popping up yeah. okay. in, the, in the center of the land mass. Yeah. So there's three new laws of weather. Earth's weather is changed by hyquotherms. Hyquotherms are changed by gravitational astronomical cycles. So you not only have the sun's gravity, but you also have the moon's gravity. Because the moon's gravity, uh, the effect of the moon's gravity on the Earth is actually twice as much as the sun's gravity on the Earth. Because it's four times closer, I think. Or something like that. It's, it's a lot closer. Um, Oh, I think the moon is 400 times smaller, and I think it's 400 times closer or something like that. Um, anyway, number three, the earth tide, atmospheric pressure, um, and the geofield are directly connected through these gravitational astronomical cycles. Okay. 
So those are the three new laws of weather. And it kind of talks about these high pressure systems. So the H's here are the high pressure systems. And you've probably seen these weather maps uh, where the weatherman is pointing out the highs and the lows and um, how there's a, a storm front in between the highs and the low pressure systems and stuff. Um, the importance of atmospheric pressure on Earth's weather cannot be overemphasized. But if you have a hyquotherm with steam coming out of the Earth, you're actually creating a high pressure system, right, as that expands. And we did a simple science experiment with my students where we put just a tiny bit of water in a balloon and tied it off and put it in a microwave and it inflates the balloon in like 30 seconds to a minute. Um, and that's because that little bit of water is changing. I, we put three milliliters or, or three th cc's, so just a tiny bit. And so it still looked like a deflated balloon. Um, but it inflates, and it, of course it's inflating because that steam is pushing out in all directions. Okay. And that's important because the weather model, again, this is from NOAA, the National um, Astrono Oceanic and A A Astronomical Association. Um, so they say that um, although it's air, air is said to be sinking over high pressure areas, it is rising and rising under low pressure areas. The evidence for this claim is lacking. And I think the reason they got confused about this is because how a barometer was originally made. They basically had a pan of mercury and they took a meter long or more um, tube that looked like a test tube that they had filled with mercury and then they inverted it, that test tube in, a, in the pan of mercury. And so then you had the balance of pressure, the pressure pushing down on the mercury in the pan, and the, the long um, test tube that was filled with mercury that wanted to flow down and out, right? And so what happened is it creates a little vacuum in the top, or, or it's the bottom end of the test tube, but it's at the top in this example, it creates a little vacuum there, and that's how they measure what the standard atmospheric pressure is. It's like 700 millimeters of mercury. So, um, so if they had like a meter long test tube, it would drop down to the 75 centimeter level, and the space there would be a vacuum because there was no air in the test tube to begin with. But the mercury is heavy and it's dropping down that much. Um, so, so then they think that the high pressure is pushing down and they can actually measure higher pressure when it's pushing down more and pushes the mercury up in the test tube. And low pressure is when it's not pushing down on the mercury in the pan and it comes up. So depending on how that mercury moves in the test tube, kind of like a thermometer, um, that they measure the length of that in millimeters of mercury. Incidentally, that's why they measure uh, blood pressure in millimeters of mercury too. Um, so um, that's the, the pressure. So, so I think that that's why the weathermen, um, meteorologists, and the NOAA um, got confused about this. They think that the high pressure is stacking up. And so the high pressure is all stacking up and pushing down on the pan of mercury to push it up inside the tube. And so they think that high pressure is pushing down, and then low pressure is when the uh, the hot air has risen up and, and uh, it's lower and lower pressure. But 
we're saying in the universal model, we're giving new atmospheric pressure reality, saying that high pressure causes the air to expand in all directions and pushes out because that hyquotherm, water turning to steam, changes 1,700 times the volume, so it's going to push out pretty fast, especially if, there, if you've got a fault line with like an earthquake happening under the ground and that um, water is going to be turned to steam really quick and it's going to expand really quick and, and push the clouds away from that area. That's why high pressure is usually considered a fair weather um, area. And it's the low pressure is where you have the storms because that's where all the, um, where the air is moving towards. So high pressure causes the air to expand in all directions, just like the balloon example, and especially towards the contracting, cool, low pressure areas. That's where the air wants to condense, is in that low pressure area. And so that's where you have the rain, right? It's cond condensation. Okay, and you can think of it like this. If you think of the red balloons as high pressure areas where the air is expanding and the blue balloons as the low pressure areas where the the balloon is shrinking then this gives you a good example of the high and low pressure areas okay so the blue is cooling and contracting pressure is decreasing whereas the red is the pressure increasing with warming expanding like the deflated balloon in the microwave is blowing up. Okay. Any questions about that? It makes a nice visual here, so hopefully you got it. And here's another experiment that it talks about in the universal model with a weather pressure system where they had a cup of ice on the right-hand side of this aquarium. They had a divider in between with a couple of notches, one at the bottom, one at the top so that the air can flow through. They put an incense in beforehand to make a little smoke so we could see which way the weather, the air is moving. And then on the picture on the right here, they put hot, you know, almost nearly boiling water in on the left-hand side of the aquarium. And you can see the smoke and air all flowing and moving towards that cold ice on the right. And so right after the experiment, the hot water was removed, the high pressure areas expand in all directions, and the low pressure areas contract from all directions. So you're seeing that flow, all right? So that should kind of help you see and establish the fact that our, our theory is right, our, the model is that high pressure is expanding in all directions and it's going to move towards areas where it's cold and where there's a low pressure area. Okay. So now we're going to talk about the earthquake cloud evidence. And this always kind of gets people interested because the sky and earth are interconnected through weather. And we're claiming that earthquake clouds actually form. And immediately after an earthquake, a strange cloud appeared above the epicenter. And that was in the Journal of Geodynamics back in 2002. So we've, there's been several researchers that have noticed this phenomenon that this strange cloud appears over the area where the earthquake is and where the water vapor is escaping. And we can actually look at some. So we have the uh, impending earthquake here. This is, these are over time. It has the date and time stamp there on the bottom. But this was an actual um, prediction for an earthquake. And um, so here, here there's no cloud. Um, that little area there is the uh, Caspian Sea, I think. Yeah. The Caspian Sea, uh, this is back in uh, two, 2005, 
So June 19th of 2005 at 1500 hours is the first one here and that's before anything's happening. The Caspian Sea is right here. So this was an earthquake that happened later in I Iraq, I think, or Iran, maybe. Um, so, so here again, the Caspian Sea, but right here, this little cloud appears um, five hours later. Okay, and then and it develops, grows a little bigger, right? And then it starts to expand and kind of get blown around with the air and then it starts to get pushed off to the side and starting to dissipate it's nearly gone here and it's dispersed in this picture which is now um, the next day at 1500 hours so these are one day apart okay but then a new cloud appears over the same spot where this, this one appeared, a new cloud's appearing, developing, growing larger, then expanding more a little later. Then it's starting to spread out and expand, and, get, and then it starts to move north as the, the, the wind is blowing it. Um, because although the hyquotherm is creating the cloud, with the steam, it's also creating the wind, right? That's going to push, push the cloud away. So it's moving northeast here and, and then dissipates into other clouds. Um, so this is on, that's actually two days later. So this one, this is, this is one day after this one. And then this is, an, um, you know, half a day later or something. Okay, so by tracking this, then we have scientists that is actually uh, predicting this. Um, and this is done, um, Sho is his last name, S-H-O-U. Um, he has a Chinese name that I have trouble pronouncing, but, um, but he's the one that has done this prediction. Oh, actually, I have his name later in my slides. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, this is an interesting story because this is actually um, talking about the Christchurch earthquake in uh, New Zealand. And the, the, son, the author of the Universal Model, his son, his name is Perry, sessions and he was in New Zealand um, when he was 19 years old and he um, saw some he and a friend that he was with saw these unusual clouds and they're kind of wondering at him looking at him because they they looked unusual and seemed to be in lines and stuff and um, after looking at that because he had been taught this all his life he said to his friend, I wouldn't be surprised if there's an earthquake. Okay, now they hadn't felt any tremors. In fact, they didn't feel any tremors. But the next person that they talked to said, hey, did you hear that there was an earthquake in Christ Church? You know, another city over. Because they were far enough away that they didn't feel it. This is showing pictures of the hydro crater and some hydro sediment from that earthquake. But this earthquake was actually predicted um, from the clouds by a 19-year-old kid that had been exposed to the universal model. It, it would be kind of like a sinkhole. Um, that, that, yeah, you're asking how the hydro craters form. Um, sometimes they do blow out sand. Um, and, and sometimes they'd blow out water, and obviously they could blow out a lava as well, but, um, you know, depending on where it's located relative to the, to the fault line. Um, and this one seemed to blow out quite a bit of uh, sediment, so, um, yeah. 
So um, they, they can happen quite a few different ways. Um, but just to show you, these clouds would be earthquake clouds. How do narrowly defined bands of linear clouds like these form one after another in only minutes? Okay, and with this understanding of hyquotherms, you can picture you have a fault line down in the ground and it's causing steam to rise up. That steam, we don't see it from the ground up to um, until it condenses into a cloud, but um, once that cloud then is forming above a fault line, so that cloud is forming above a fault line, but then it's also creating the high pressure system, this wind that's pushing it away, and so you have a wind then coming and blowing that line of cloud away and then forming another one and then blowing that away and forming another one blowing that away and so we have here what is that eight different lines that we can see in this picture that are all small earthquake clouds reverting resulting from that hypothermal pressure changes oh yeah that's good so we need to talk about clouds and how you recognize clouds so uh, stratus clouds up here on the upper right are formed by evaporation and they're big sheet-like clouds. So those would be the ones that are evaporating from the ocean and blowing across the sky, right? They're very high and they're very broad, expansive sheets. So that's stratus clouds. The cirrus clouds are thin and wispy because there are other clouds maybe that have been blown apart. And uh, the cumulus clouds are the ones that are formed by endovaporization, so from a hyquotherm in the earth, and so they, they're the ones that billow up very quickly, and they look soft and fluffy. They usually have a flat bottom because the steam coming up, we don't see it until it gets into a certain area, a certain level where the pressure, temperature is all right, and it kind of condenses so we can see it. And then they stack up, and they can stack up taller and taller. Yeah. Because the air is expanding. Because the air, yeah, the air is continuing to expand. The steam is continuing to come up and out in all directions, and so they get bigger and taller. And you can kind of see that happening just from that picture. The, the lines. You can't see it. Oh, right? you, you, is, there, you, is there a way to see them through like a thermal camera, just like point oh. at a fault line and see if we can see that column of hot? I mean, how hot is, is this? Like there should be. Yeah. If you're standing the, there, would you get steam burn? Um, I don't think it's. I don't think you'd notice it that much. I don't think it'd be quite that hot. But, okay. but I I think it would be detectable. So, yeah, we and should. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've been kind of thinking of that. How can we test it? How can we explore it? Um, there's uh, like, um, yeah, there's some, there's some tests with the phones where you can have apps and you can attach different devices like to measure temperature and measure wind speed and stuff like that. And, I've been thinking we need to get, you know, like a whole bunch of students to, you know, cover the area and, and have these, you know, temperature, pressure, um, wind speed monitors and do that. I, I would definitely like to do, to do that. But, um, you know, being at the right place at the right time with the right equipment to do that uh, would be the challenge. You never know when it's going to stretch. Right, right. But... But, I mean, I, I think we could. I think we could figure it out and, and do that. Um, but it, it would take. Yeah, the fault lines aren't going to move a lot. And, and I, I mean, like here in Arizona, we have some mountains to the um, east of us. And that's where we often see these cumulus clouds popping up in the morning, right? 
So classification by formation, we have evaporative clouds. Those are the cirrus and the stratus clouds that are formed by evaporation. Then we have the earth tide clouds. Those are cumulus clouds formed from minor endovaporization. So I think we talked about that once before in here, the earth tide, how in addition to ocean tides, where the surface of the earth moves up and down twice a day, maybe as much as 14 feet, we have earth tide where here in Arizona, the ground moves up about 11 inches um, twice a day. As the moon goes around the earth, right, 11 inches is about the size of a sheet of paper. And so um, the earth, the ground that we stand on is moving up and down about that much twice a day as the moon goes around the earth. So um, that is the earth tide. And so those cumulus clouds are earth tide clouds. Or they could be earthquake clouds, which are clouds that are formed by major endovaporization. So if we got more activity at the fault lines um, and more heat being generated, we're going to have more steam coming out. And, and so we would call those earthquake clouds. But both of those are, uh, look like cumulus clouds. And this picture is interesting. On the bottom here, on the, ver on the left of the bottom picture, you can see a cloud, a cumulus cloud, and then over here, just above it to the right, um, is the same cloud a few minutes later. And so it, you can see, like you were talking about, how the clouds billow up. And, and there, um, it's, it's not as big as when it's like this big, huge mountain uh, there to the right. Uh, so these cumulus clouds are hyquotherm formed clouds. And they could be either considered earthquake clouds or earth tide clouds, depending on how dramatic it is. Okay, so anytime you're seeing a cumulus cloud, now you know how that cumulus cloud is formed. And they're, they're the easiest cloud to recognize because they're all soft and fluffy, look like cotton balls, or, um, and they're usually flat on the bottom, yeah. So... Okay, so, um, so that's a huge factor in weather, okay? And we see it with uh, tornadoes as well. Scientists still do not know the exact mechanism by which most tornadoes form. And why would both of these tornadoes occur in May, one in 1981 and the other in 1999 in Oklahoma? And it probably has to do with fault lines and high pressure systems um, because it does, uh, the high and low pressures spin the, um, the, the air that's moving, the wind that's created from these hyquotherms moves as well in, and it spins around, uh, around on the surface. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's great. That's fine. Because <laughs> I'm not going to explore that a lot. Right? Yes. Exactly. Factors. When you realize the moon, yeah. So you got the, the factors of the moon and the sun and the position of those things along with the fault lines in the earth. And you put that together and you can, can really get some, some air moving, strong winds and create tornadoes. So, no, that's great. It's, it's quite all right. In fact, did you notice, uh, did you see on the news recently that here in Arizona we had a tornado that touched down? Yeah. Um, I don't think I got a picture of it in my slide presentation, uh, but it, it looked a lot like this, and I was interested to find, as I, as I did look it up and, and copied the picture, um, that it was up near Meteor Crater. It was like 11 miles from Meteor Crater, which, of course, we consider a diatreme 
from crisscrossing earthquake fault lines, which would create steam, high pressure zones, and could get this tornado swirling. So that just happened uh, about a week ago here. Um, so the global weather system evidence. So again, we're talking global weather system, El Nino and La Nina, and um, the, the, they're, they're measuring the uh, number of centimeters high or low that these, um, that the surface um, height of the ocean is. And so it could be 14 centimeters higher in this hot area here, right? That's what the white there would be like 14 centimeters um, higher in, um, in, in altitude. And the average sea surface temperature might rise 3.5 degrees centigrade or 7 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's not a huge difference in the temperature, right? 7 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's not a huge difference in the height. It's 14 centimeters higher. <laughs> but it has a dramatic effect on weather. Okay. Yeah, it's a huge area. That's the thing. Um, and and then going colder too, it also decreases the height, maybe as much as 18 centimeters lower in the height of the in this cold area as well. Okay. So. Uh, how could the sun, I'm looking at the bottom right here, how could the sun cool and heat these ocean surface waters along the equator at the same time? Because in this picture here, we have the hot area on the right, which is white, and the cold area on the left, which is purple. And you can see the black here is where the United States is. So this area is as big as the United States. Yeah, but that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, just because they don't they don't change that rapidly, right? Then then it would change every day as the sun as the earth spins relative to the sun. Um, and we could track that going around um, every day. But this is actually called El Nino because um, it means the baby. It, it usually happens in December. And uh, it's off the coast, uh, that hot, where it's hitting land here is off the coast of Ecuador. So it was Ecuador um, fishermen that actually named it because it's around December when we celebrate um, Christmas, and El Nino is the baby, uh, the Christ child. So um, that's kind of where it's got its name from the fishermen in, in um, Ecuador or Peru. Um, so hyquotherms, uh, I'm going up to the upper left there, hyquotherms under the ocean crust create plumes of hot water that rise to the surface and create global weather patterns. So in the picture of the water cycle here, you can see the, where the hyquotherm is pointing to that. That's under the surface of the ocean. Um, at the bottom of the ocean, it's heating and creating a mega plume. So that's a heated mega plume. And that's why it doesn't change every day. Um, in fact, this map on the right is showing you the sea surface temperatures, which are, are pretty consistent um, all the way around the globe and get cooler as you go towards the poles because that's the sun surface temperature heating it up. And so it does get cooler and hotter, maybe 30 degree difference from uh, the poles to the equator. 
okay? But here, um, we have the ocean surface temperature. Clouds have not been shown to be the cause of the cooling, because that's another idea that people have had for how it could be cooled. As the world sea surface temperature map below illustrates, the sun shines equally along the equator, heating the ocean surface evenly. Therefore, there must be another source for heating and cooling of these anomalous regions in the ocean, which are pictured there on the left, the cooler surface temperatures. And here's this shows it too, because uh, the top one there is in um, October of 2007, and the bottom one is July of 1999. And you can see where it is um, has changed. And the, the sun would be moving relative to land, moves up. And so, um, let's see, it should be. Why would these ocean surface temperatures become cool just on the equator in October, as seen on the left, and then cooler in the summer along the whole northern hemisphere, as seen in the July images, the lower left, if the sun was responsible for the temperature change? Okay, so different positions and yet huge areas being changed in temperature. Okay. And those El Nino, La Nina cycles, actually, this is showing you um, year after year. Um, the numbers on the bottom are the, the year number. And so we're going from like 1950 to 2010. And um, you can see it goes in cycles. And so these are those cycles when you have the sun and the moon both involved and it's changing the um the cycle so that we we have here uh, a long period where it's cooler water and look at this area um which it looks like six or seven years that's all hotter okay but if you if you look at it in like an 18 year cycle that's where it kind of makes sense because the sun and moon's positions change in that time frame. And so it's creating mega plumes. And like in this map, showing those mega plumes down in the ocean, trying to show them in a three dimensional picture. Um, here is Australia in the uh, bottom of the picture. And then we have the coast of the Americas along the right side and the Asia up on the north, left. And, and so we have huge areas. Hot is the red, and then cold is the blue. So uh, three-dimensionally, these are huge areas that are, are being heated or, or are cooler. OK, and we have that also in, that was the Pacific Ocean. Uh, you had a question? Probably, Anything yeah. Hotter is caused by the, um, the flu. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would say so, yeah. And we have the same thing in the Atlantic Ocean where we have a huge area of heated waters. Um, it's called the Bermuda or the Azores High because it tends to go back and forth between the, those islands in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and this is the high... Uh, pressure, hot weather system that ends up creating the hurricanes that always tend to go into Florida and up the East Coast. Okay, so there's the islands of Azores and Bermuda, and um, that's kind of where. Um, let's see. I think there is a map actually that. I have later on that, that shows where those hurricanes come through. Um, but it, it does follow that hot water along the uh, Caribbean and then up into Florida and or, or the Gulf and then out the East Coast. Okay. 
So now we're going to go into the geofield model, um, which is kind of the second half of the chapter here. Um, I need to see how I'm doing on time. What? Okay. And the uh, this the geofield model is going from a magnetic field, which we've all heard of and talked about, to a piezo field. Piezo field. Okay, so Earth magnetic field, this is what we're taught in school about the magnetic field. And they draw it like there's a magnet inside the center of the Earth that goes from the North Pole to the South Pole. And that it has these nice, very formal, organized lines, just like the lines that are from a magnet. The, the picture in the bottom center there, they actually have a magnet under the paper that has a North and a South Pole and the magnetite little flakes uh, of iron filings have been spread out on the paper and they've organized themselves um, on the north and south pole and in lines going from the north to the south pole, very much like the drawing on the left. So that's an experiment that they do to kind of show what that, that is supposed to look like. And on the right, it's showing how that magnetic field protects us from solar winds that come from the sun. So very important factor, but the magnetic field doesn't exactly look like this. And it's not as simple and organized as it says. So we need to learn about this piezoelectric uh, effect and the piezoelectric film is... Um, if you think about taking uh, quartz um, grains and um, laminating them in between two sheets of plastic, you get this quartz film that is shown in the top picture here, which they have then attached a light bulb to. And we're putting that in a vise so we can hold it still and flick that, that film, that laminated uh, quartz film and no, no electricity before movement but then as we move it electricity is generated after the film is flexed back and forth. So when you have quartz crystals being pushed and moved against each other you can generate electricity. Um, I was trained as a physical therapist and we use that um, piezoelectric effect in ultrasound um, that they do for therapy, not the, not the picture ultrasounds, but the ultrasound because it's a, when you apply electricity to a quartz crystal, you can create vibrations and that vibration creates that ultrasound that does a micromassage to the cells. Um, and What's that? Does it wear out the quartz? No, it doesn't wear out the quartz. Mm -mm. Yeah. They can be used for a long time. Um, and so there's this piezoelectric um, experiment where they took rocks and smashed them in a vice. Um, um, so here on the right, they have a setup with a, a, um, a vise where you can um, crank it down with this C-clamp, right? And they're, so they have a little copper sheet on each side of the rock that they're testing, and they tested a whole bunch of rocks in this experiment, different kinds of rocks. And they, um, so with a copper sheet on each side of the rock, and then a rubber sheet, in between that as insulation so that the electricity that's generated from the pressure on the rock is not being dissipated into the metal of the C-clamp. Okay, and then they had leads attached to the copper sheets that go to this voltmeter and so they could actually measure voltage that's generated um, or electricity that's generated by putting pressure and squeezing these rocks. 
And so here they're squeezing all the different rocks and they actually measure the amount um, in this science experiment. Um, any questions about that? So if you, if you, so understanding that, right, most of the continental crust of the earth is quartz-based crystals, which have a high uh, rating in this. The, the river rock, I think, was the highest one, but it's a quartz-based rock as well. It's just, um, has, it's, it's not crystal, but it's a quartz-based rock. Uh, and, and quartz was pretty high too. Um, so those crystal rocks, um, you can put a lot of pressure and create uh, higher energy. Uh, they did in this experiment, yeah. Um, let's see, we'd have to turn to that page in the book, I guess, to, <laughs> to look at it, yeah. Uh, let, let's look at that later. Um, so we use copper as zero, um, and I think, I think even the river lock was only one digit higher, so it's not huge amounts. Uh, of electricity, but but it was measurable. Um, so I would say that it was significant. Okay, so this is more of a picture of what the geofield actually looks like, and and there's pictures of where they're trying to map out the magnetic field of the Earth, and it comes up with a picture that looks more like this one on the right, where they're they've got lines going all over the place, all different directions. Uh, I mean, not literally different directions, because uh, what we're trying to show here on the left is that you can map it out. Um, and, and so the, the main field total intensity, um, they're measuring different amounts of where that magnetic um, areas are. And um, so you get, just like with the high and low pressure systems, you get different areas like you do in a weather map, here they're doing it with the, the magnetic or um, electrical energy that's created. Because when you have a current running through a wire, you create a magnetic field around it. Also, you can use a magnetic field to create an electrical field. Okay, so they, they relate together. Um, So, no, this is measuring electrical or magnetic energy right. is what this is mapping out. So they probably do affect the high and low pressure systems as well, which is another factor that we haven't necessarily factored into this. But, but, they're being, but what we're saying is that they are being created from the electrical energy of the pressure at those fault lines, you know, with earth tide, and the land mass is going up and down and frictional heating happening, you, that frictional heating is also creating electrical energy that's being dissipated and spread throughout the, the crust. And so it's creating electrical energy fields in different areas of, of the continents, yeah. So basically, without a perfect orbit of forces creating the tide, the planet would basically yeah, no you're saying without the, the, moon, the oh. orbit and the moon and the sun's position, yeah, you wouldn't have the weather that we have today. You're right. It wouldn't, we wouldn't have a mechanism to change the weather as much without that earth tide, ocean tide, and all the heating that's generated from it. Because the sun is so far away, it's creating minimal heating. I mean, it's significant heating, right? I mean, it changes the temperature 30 degrees or so from night to day a lot of times. But um, so, I mean, it is dramatic, but it's not going to quickly evaporate water. It slowly evaporates water. Um, but so that's one factor, but then you have all these other factors. So it, 
it makes a big difference. Um, so the geofield is very um, hard to map out, but these, this is trying it. And so let's go into the new planetary piezo laws. The first planetary piezo law is that energy fields around the planetary bodies, like the Earth and other planets, are created by piezoelectricity in the body's crust. So the crust of the Earth. Um, and one of the things I should have mentioned about the old model of the magnet, you know, the, the modern science, one where it has the, what looks like a great big magma in the center of the Earth. Well, those are the, the people who believe that also believe that there's magma inside the center of the Earth. And the problem is, if you heat a magnet up above the Curie point, which I think is 640 degrees, not very high, not very high then you destroy the magnetism. And you, even though you cool it back down, you never get the magnetism back. Okay? So how would we have any magnetic field on the Earth if there was magne, magma inside the center of the Earth? And, and this kind of, because it's talking about how it's at the body's crust, we have more magnetism at the crust than we do in the core from what we're measuring, okay? The second planetary piezo field law is that a planetary's body piezo field is controlled by the makeup of the piezoelectric materials in the crust and the astronomical tidal forces acting on the body. So the materials are the type of rocks, whether it's river rocks or quartz crystals or um, other types of crystals or rocks, and then we have the tidal forces that is pulling and flexing the surface of the Earth as the moon and the sun go around. Okay, here's another experiment, the 24-hour weather jar experiment, and this is measuring inside this jar, so it's a closed system, but we're seeing high pressure that is also related to high temperatures. And then the geofield and the humidity dropping uh, opposite to those. But if we put, um, so if we match them up, we get the next law, which is the law of weather parameters where we're putting pressure with the geofield so that those two are together. Uh, you know, the, like when the pressure was high, the geofield was low. But then that is equal or proportional to the temperature and the humidity of the air. Again, the temperature was the high when the humidity was low, right? Because warmer air is going to evaporate the humidity so it's not going to be as humid and so that's in a controlled sealed environment so you have to remember this lot applies to a closed sealed system like in that jar but it is going to help and affect and help us understand other things as as we understand weather so geofield evidence um, lightning is an interesting one um, so, question for you, like, here we have a volcano erupting, so from our previous classes, some of you that have been here as a regular, um, what is generating the, um, the heat to produce the lava that's coming out of the volcano? Where would that volcano be likely to be located? On a fault line. On a fault line. Okay, so the, the volcano is likely located on a fault line, and so we have the frictional heating of that fault line that is causing the um, rock to melt and turn to uh, lava. And notice there's a big cloud of steam coming out. We usually hear it called an ash cloud 
but it's like 90% steam out of volcanoes. And so we have that frictional heating pressure of, at the fault line and look at the other weather factor that we have, the lightning striking at the same moment. Okay, so do you see that piezoelectric effect um, happening? Incidentally, um, if you have a grill, like a gas grill, that has a little automatic starter button. When you push that starter button, you're putting pressure on a quartz-based crystal that then creates the spark that lights the gas grill. Okay, so those starters are like this lightning. Okay, yeah. Ooh, um, I, I, I don't. Oh yeah, you're moving. Yeah. So that's generating a lot of electricity. Yeah. Or is it just the, the earth, you know, moving of the earth? You know, yeah. Is it a magnet where it destroys it? Is it actually enhanced or? That's a that's a great question. Whether the moving ro molten rock is what's causing the lightning or whether it's just the earthquake on the fault line. Uh, and I don't know specifically, but lightning does happen a lot with earthquakes and volcanoes. So, Oh, yeah. Around it maybe, yeah. I, I don't know. I think we need to do a lot more research, right? Because... I mean, this is really, yeah. <laughs> oh, heat the rock. If it happens more where the molten is. Wow, great, great idea. Yeah, trying to melt the. Yeah. Uh, that'd be interesting. Wow. Yeah. Some good ideas for good experiments. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is, this is all new revolutionary stuff, right? I mean, this completely flips upside down what modern meteorologists who have college degrees and are on every news station in every big city in America, right? We've got the weather guy that's pointing out highs and lows, and they have it completely upside down. That's how it works. So the connection between large earthquakes and electromagnetic phenomena in the ground and in the ionosphere is becoming increasingly solid. So as scientific research expands, we are finding more of this. But I think we, we do need to do a lot more research, too. Um, so QuakeFinder is an organization that is doing some research on this stuff. And um, they're, they've designed this satellite, uh, QuakeSat. Uh, that's a very small satellite, but it's designed to um, identify magnetic fields, and, um, and it's measuring those um, out in the ionosphere, um, farther away from the Earth. Um, and so it's, it's signaling those. So you have the wave propagation from the Earth and then up into the ionosphere. So. Interesting, um, and, and QuakeFinder, I think QuakeFinder.com is their website, so you can find out more about their organization, um, as well as this is just one particular tool that they're coming up with to, to start to measure this. Um, each of these graphs are from uh, what we call the Russian geofield evidence, and all of them um, are measuring the... Okay, so here was an earthquake uh, in the bottom right and the bottom left. Uh, we have an earthquake anomaly and how that is affecting um, pretty dramatically that from the geofield. So all of these are showing that um, the electricity is being generated and, and in a measurable way um, from, from that, uh, those forces. 
The aurora evidence is another interesting one, right? Very pretty northern lights, aurora borealis. But from these pictures, you can see that they are close to the coastline, right? So you can see it's like it wants to form here, but it really forms close to the land mass, OK? Thereby, let's see, this would be Greenland and Iceland, right? Um, and, and then here's uh, the northern coast of Alaska. It's also forming along that as well. OK, so Aurora Borealis forms near the coastline. No theory can presently account for the formation of such coastline auroras, except this, our theories can, because we have the continental crust that is mostly quartz-based rock. And as it flexes and moves, that, that energy field is um, is on that continental land mass, and it's not as strong over the oceans. Okay? So that's pr pretty dramatic evidence that coincides with this. And basically, now we know the aurora borealis is that energy field, electrical visible energy um, that's being generated from these hypotherms in the continental crust at fault lines. OK? So the geo, uh, geofield continental connection um, is showing how the increased strength of the Earth's energy field over large land masses is not a coincidence. It is a direct result of the piezo field nature of the Earth's energy field. And so this is showing you a uh, high energy field on the left there. The red is the high energy field, which you can see is right over North America. And then low energy fields out in the oceans. Okay. And again, continental auroras. We have Russia and the United States, the aurora being created over those areas, very bright and much less so over the oceans, OK? So this is looking down on the Earth from above the North Pole in the upper right picture here, and then at a little bit of an angle on this one, but still, uh, it's over Canada is the brightest area there, and not out here over the oceans nearly as much, OK? Auroras are generally brightest where the geofield is the strongest, as seen in these images, this is over continents and not over the oceans. Magnostat evidence. We have the original image um, on the left there, uh, which would probably be magnetic field. Um, and then what we did is we lightened up um, the areas so that we could focus on the adjusted image. In the adjusted image, the mid-range colors have been muted, leaving only the strongest and the weakest energy fields to reveal the source of energy fields, which are clearly over the continents. So the red is the strongest, as you can see, over continental land masses. Okay. And it's weakest. The greens and blues are the weakest. And so those, you can see, are the ocean areas. OK, so we muted out the, the yellows um, so that we can see the highs are over continents. OK, so this is from magnetic readings that, that they're giving us this map. Uh, um, I should ask you if there's any questions about that. OK. All right, good. The ozone or chlorofluorocarbon pseudo theory, OK? Um, so the ozone hole, if ozone depleting gases in the atmosphere have decreased, what should the ozone hole reflect? 
right? They, they say that because we're driving cars, right, that are spewing out these carbons, uh, these hydrocarbons out into the, uh, into the air, that we're destroying the ozone, and the ozone is um, O3. Um, so instead of H or O2, which is normal oxygen that we have in the air, it's, it's three oxygen molecules all linked together, is, is what forms that ozone. And so this is showing it um, over the poles. Um, this is over Antarctica. You can kind of see that in these pictures, Antarctica. Um, but it's changing. And so this is mapping it out year by year. And so why would it be if the ozone hole is because we're creating more carbons, um, then why is it up in 2000 and then down 2001, up in 2002, down in 2003, up in 2004, up again in 2005, down in 2006, and then up in 2007, right? So um, it, it's not going because we're driving our cars, is my point, okay? So the ozone hole... And it's record-breaking year there in 2006 is when it's, we have that biggest area. Okay. Global warming is a pseudo-theory because we have long-term times of warming, cooling, warming, cooling. Um, and the instrumentation, instrumental observation error is pretty dramatic and significant as well. So um, we think that the there is no uh, that that global warming and cooling goes in cycles up and down, um, but it's not as dramatic as the news media wants us to think or or political activists. It is back to the drawing board for the carbon cycle models, is what that climatologist said. Um, because the carbon dioxide problem is just not as dramatic as we would think. Um, Earth's oblateness, the uh, spherical Earth, should be round, but it does increase and decrease um, because of the moon and uh, other factors. So um, that's the oblateness. Okay, and I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to kind of speed through things here. Um, illustrating the sea level rise. Um, it's incorrect that if you have a bunch of um, ice, right, the, they say that the polar caps are melting because of all of our driving cars. But when the ice melts, it doesn't automatically raise the level of the ocean because the continents are kind of like they're floating, like this pumice uh, continental example. And so as the ice melts and raises the level of the ocean, the level of the continent is also going to rise, too. And it, it, you also don't have that ice sitting on top of the continent as well, weighing it down. So that's what that's trying to show. Um, isostasy principle is that as that iceberg melts, it's going to continue to float up, or the continents are going to float up. So this is showing that Art Antarctic warming trend. And so there is areas that are getting warmer and, and melting those polar ice caps, but um, the continents are going to adjust as well. So the weather and geofield prediction, this is the last subchapter, so I'm going to... Um, so the discovery of Ganymede's magnetic field shows that something needs to be modified in the accepted description of the evolution of the solar system. Okay, So um, Ganymede is one of the moons of Jupiter, which you can see there on the left is Jupiter with its big red spot. Um, that's hardly in the picture, but... Um, and, and Jupiter has several moons, and all of these moons um, affect each other 
and, and pull on each other with gravitational forces. We've looked at that with hydro fountains being produced on these moons of Jupiter and the, also on the moons of Saturn. Um, but this is talking about how they're also finding the magnetic field is not what they expected. And yet, as we look at the different planets, as well as the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, we're finding that our model for the piezoelectric field makes a lot of sense with these other planets as well. Because on some of them it's high and some of them it's low. Okay, the 2011 earthquake and tsunami, um, there was a lot of liquefaction. Uh, this is showing the destruction and um, that's showing where in Japan that uh, epicenter was. Uh, the bird was trapped in sand by the tsunami that followed the earthquake because um, the sand being spewed out. Uh, we can predict changes in the Earth's geofield and the weather using the six new laws of geometeorology because we're linking the geology, the land masses, now with the meteorology, what's happening in the atmosphere. Because as you can see from what we talked about, they're very closely linked together. And uh, what we thought was a magnetic field is actually a geo piezoelectric field um, that has dramatic effects as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Trapped in the mud, you're right. Uh, your comment that the uh, dinosaurs getting trapped in the mud would be similar to that is, is very good. Okay, um, so uh, there is more to that, but that's about as much as I can get in today. I appreciate your coming and your attention and participation. Um, and if you visit Do True Science, you can do that either on Facebook or on YouTube. Uh, on my Do True Science Facebook channel is where I post some of the experiments that I'm doing with the um, youth that are in my classes here at American Family Education. And uh, we thank American Family Education for providing this facility for us to use. Um, and on the YouTube channel is where we'll be posting the video of this presentation uh, so you can uh, watch it there. And then I also want to thank Darren Clough for doing our video recording and encourage you to go to universalmodel.com. Um, you can buy the Universal Model book. Um, and right now, uh, volume two has been out electronically, but they are taking pre-orders for volume two in print. So that is going to the printers uh, very soon and will be out in a few months. Um, and so you can pre-order that now online. If you do order anything from universalmodel.com, I encourage you to use my code, which is do true. It's a code that will give you, I think, a 10% discount uh, on the books and stuff that you order there. Um, so thank you very much. All right. Any other questions you have? Tons of questions. <laughs>